Thank you. Um, yes, we'll talk about uh, how we map social compliance during COVID-19, or how we try to map it. So uh, this is basically the structure. Why did I spend one and a half years engaging myself with the pandemic? I don't know. Um, that's a very quickly answer, but um, it basically started with a small project, which looks like this now. So it was me and my uh, roommate, Thomas. We made an exam, which is called social compliance during high students and periods, and how it efficiently, efficiently reduces COVID-19 incidents. Um, and we use Google Mobility Reports, which is a setup that's actually made to study the pandemic. Um, and then, uh, PhD in biology, he picked it up and he said that uh, he thought it looked good. And then we attended a conference with COVID-19 and there I met uh, the whole project, which is uh, how uh, demo our democratic societies uh, act during a pandemic and they've received lots of awards for their work during the pandemic, but we'll move into that later. So first I'll go through this study. And then uh, we'll go through how does the whole project measure compliance, and then how can we actually make an index of compliance in Danish society or in the Danish municipalities. And then uh, we'll see how this is done both uh, with like mobility reduction in society, but also just by asking people. But that's uh, how social scientists do it. Welcome. Um, yeah, so social compliance, this first, it's like a buzzword. What is it actually? Basically, the first um, deduction that I'll be doing is just that social compliance is the interaction between social mobility. So that would be you moving to your home during high strength periods. When are you moving around residential areas? When are you not moving around transit stations? You're not taking the train when you're supposed to stay at home. You're not going to work when you're supposed to stay at home. That's social compliance in the first definition. Yes. So we took a starting point in this literature, basically, that warmer temperature reduces the prevalence of virus. And already you can see that warmer temperature reduces the prevalence of virus. So people are um, infected less in society. But also warmer temperature means that you're staying in places that are not making people be infected as much. So we have like this double effect that will try to disentangle. And that demographic and socioeconomic and mobility trends have an impact on the transmission, and that lowered mobility from Google Mobility Reports, which I'll go through later, um, is associated with fewer cases of COVID-19. And just that in general, travel time is reduced, which is not a big fact, but it's good to get it down on paper. So what do we want to do with the, this evidence? We want to understand the population's reaction uh, to the restrictions. So how does um, this interaction with residential mobility and transit mobility interact with the restrictions that the government has implemented in society and how does weather interact with the uh, government's stringencies. So during high stringency periods, what happens when the weather is also warm? And during low stringency periods, what happens when the weather is also warm with the pandemic? So we are modeling COVID-19 incidents, the amount of COVID cases per 100,000 residents in each municipality now. That's the first part. And just kind of a rhetoric question, or just a question, like the biggest problem when using observational data. So we're not making a, a study now like your professors do. We're not putting people in a scanner. We're not uh, measuring them and keeping everything constant but one variable, but we're looking at society now. So the biggest problem when looking at societal or, or using observational data is made a variable bias. We, do, we cannot control everything. There will be a lot of things that we cannot control, so we need to be aware of this. And the first um, part of trying to structure or being aware of this is by modulating uh, incidents. So this is what you call an autoregressive process. This is the cases of COVID-19 in Denmark per 100,000 capita in the period from um, September 2020 to March 2021. Um, and you can see like there's this big dip, but what an autoregressive process basically means is that the Y variable is dependent on itself with a time lag. So cases seven days ago will be associated with cases today because there, if there were 300 cases, 
if there is, there's more likely to be 400 than 100. Cases don't just drop, it's not volatile like um, Bitcoin. It, it depends <laughs> on its previous level, basically. Uh, Bitcoin would probably also be also regressive in, in some cases. But you can see that these peaks, they develop together and they fall together until you break the curve or until you break whatever they call it, the number of infections. So that's the first part of the model. So COVID-19 incidents over there, that's the Y variable. And we put lagged incidents with nine days. So we found that the best incubation time was nine days in Denmark, um, that incidents depended on, so how long time does it take for one to get infected and to get tested and for this to be another infectious case that could infect more people. That's nine days, some people meant, and we model it like that. So we need to model, um, so the societal movement now. And for this, we used um, this, oh, oh, sorry, no, this is the stringency index first. So we needed to model, uh, or to put into the model, how strict is the government right now? So there are some people at Oxford University, they measured this composite measure of government stringency and they gave us out one number per day so we would have a time series of stringency and we put that into the model and then we wanted to so the, yeah basically it's the same model just stringency added and it's like nine days again because of the same time dependency so stringency nine days ago would affect cases today because people have to get infected and they have to get tested for us to be able to observe it in the um, model or whatever in the data, yeah. So the next um, variables that we put in were weather variables, um, which was based on the same evidence as before. So we put two weather variables, temperature and precipitation. So temperature would have the double effect of people moving differently um, because of warmer temperature and because that uh, warmer temperature is Apparently, apparently affects virus in such a way that it contagious, it's less contagious or that people who carry the viruses are le less contagious. And we don't know why, but so this is the double effect, both how people move and how virus uh, behaves. And the same could be said about pre precipitation. So people move differently when it rains because they go inside or whatever, they go to each other's houses instead of, um, yeah, I don't know, going to a party. Um, yeah, then we introduce the um, mobility variables. So this is what Google called Google Community Mobility Reports. Basically, it's a measure of how the number of visitors in six different societal places changes compared to a baseline set in February 2020. So residential areas is where we live. Um, grocery and pharmacy stores, yeah basically parks, retail, recreation, transit station, workplaces. Um, and there are some theoretical reasons why we only chose two of these variables. So we only chose uh, residential areas and transit stations, so these two. And the other ones, um, there was a conceptual problem because we have one measure of the stringency in Denmark. And sometimes the stringency in Denmark uh, made it so that people would not go to work and this would give them more time to go to parks so parks the, like the measure of parks would be inflated by the actual stringency levels so people wouldn't go to workplace so if we add both uh, workplaces and parks and residential areas in the model we would have a problem of these three variables measuring the same thing so because people stay more at home they are not at the workplaces and because that um, they don't have to go to work, they have more time to go and shop. And basically, retail and recreation were closed for a long period, I think like four months. So we couldn't add this into model because it would just be random noise. Yeah, so we chose only two of the variables. So residential mobility change and transit mobility change. And we go with the same lag nine days because the time dependency between the independent variable needed to be the same. Yeah, so now, um, we go back to defining social compliance. Um, and basically this is the interaction. So the interaction between residential mobility and transit mobility and stringency here, that would be our definition of, of social compliance. So when the restriction index is high and res residential mobility is high, 
we have social compliance in a theoretical term. So we want to see how does this affect COVID-19 incidents. If more residential mobility during high stringency periods gives less incidents, we know that people are staying at home that, and that it's working. Yeah. So we add these interactions into the uh, model. And basically, this is not how you make a deck of interactions. But I thought it would uh, just represent what uh, I was trying to show, that the world is not linear. We cannot just add these variables and not expect them to interact with each other. So we expected all these variables to independently react uh, with stringency. Because if you have high incidence nine days ago, and there are no restrictions, you would get a lot of incidents in the next following days because people can do whatever they want, like we see now. We have like 4,000 cases and the cases will continuously grow um, dependent on the stringency level. So if, if the government are closing everything down, that means low stringency and COVID-19 incidence is high. Nine days ago, we would have lower incidence according to the model. So this is just uh, the model representation of what I just said. Yeah. And this is the full model. So um, for the statistics interested, we basically use the mixed effects model with random intercepts to uh, reduce the municipality incidence variation and the daily incidence variation. Yeah, and it's a time series. So every day has uh, a point for every 98 municipality in Denmark. Um, yeah, and these, this is the result that we were, that we found, and that's why we named it social compliance. So this is a three or two-way interaction plot, and basically, so on the y-axis we have uh, how many people, or the COVID-19 incidents per hundred thousand capita in each municipality, and on the x-axis we have three levels of residential mobility. So, the left one is low residential mobility, so it's one standard deviation below the average of residential mobility. It just means not very much. And the middle one means mean residential mobility and the right one means high residential mobility. And then the three lines in the three colors are three levels of restriction uh, string in C. So you see on the blue line, this is high restrictions in Denmark. So this is uh, what we know as a full lockdown. And when we have high restrictions in Denmark, and we have low residential mobility, so people are not staying at home when they're supposed to, when we are in full lockdown. Then we have a lot of cases, actually the highest amount of cases uh, that's modeled here. But if we have high residential mobility and high stringency, so people are staying at home when they're supposed to, we find a low amount of incidence. Yeah, so that's social compliance. That's, that's why we named it that, and that's what I will keep on referring to. Yeah, this is just when restrictions were strong, we found that increased residential mobility resulted in decreased COVID-19 incidents, suggesting residential mobility can be used as a proxy for compliance. The same or another effect that we found was, um, th the only thing I changed with this plot is that the x-axis is temperature. So when restrictions are high, we see that temperature has no effect on COVID-19 incidents. The blue line is just plain uh, like, uh, I don't know what it's called, but <laughs> okay. And when restrictions are low, we find that higher temperatures actually uh, reduce COVID-19 incidence significantly. But so it, it just means if, if the government, or it just means that the government implementations actually work, and that virus has no, or that weather has no effect on incidence level when the restrictions are so high. Yeah. So, what do the social scientists do? Um, they, they tackle the problem in a kind of a different way because um, so we'll turn to like previous literature has categorized like compliant behavior in two or three different categories here I'll just mention two of them but so they categorize it in preventive uh, behaviors and avoidant behaviors so avoidant behaviors would be what we just basically made an index for us. So it would be avoiding crowds, avoiding public transportation, not going to work, staying at home when you're supposed to. And preventive behavior is uh, hygiene related things and cleaning surfaces and opening your window or whatever. So what do they do to get a measure of compliance? They ask people. 
preventive behavior. Do, did you shake someone's hand yesterday? Did you hug or kiss someone? Uh, were you in a room? Did you use public transport? Were you careful? Blah, blah, blah. Avoiding behavior is when you cough, sneeze, did you do it into your sleeve? And so on and so forth. So this is basically how, and this turns into a publication. So it's, this is a valid method, and people have used it for many, many years. And when we're looking at, then they look at, okay, what psychological effects actually uh, determines whether or not you ha uh, have high preventive behavior or avoidant behavior. And what they find, and this is from the Hope Project, uh, an award-winning project, um, what they find is that self-efficacy is the most important determinant, and this is from eight countries. I'm only interested in the Danish curve. So self-efficacy, which means a person's ability to engage in protective behavior, has a high effect on preventive behavior. And how do you measure self-efficacy? You ask people. So to what degree do you feel that you know about how to avoid being infected? To what degree do you know about the symptoms of the coronavirus? And the same, about, the same way they go about institutional trust. So how much do you trust the government? Basically, they ask people. So what they determined was that self-efficacy was the most important uh, psychological effect in determining a person's level of compliance in Denmark, or like in the eight countries in Europe. Um, what I then determined from their analysis was that institutional trust and self-efficacy were the two most important psychological correlates um, for compliance. And this is uh, what I'll move on to study. Um, in my own analysis, and which I'll present now. Um, so I needed to adopt, adopt their framework. I got their data um, through my counselor, and I made a civic compliance index of their questions. They didn't stop asking a lot of their questions, um, even though they said that it was very important to study them uh, continuously. So I only used the ones that they had left, and then I could use all of their data to keep studying what they found interesting in the data, yeah. So I added basically just all of the preventive behavior and all of the avoidant behavior and just a, a general question ab about compliance and made it into an index. Um, and then I used uh, their study as a baseline, which has gotten a lot of recognition and it's, they have like 26,000 uh, uh, answers and it's very nice. Um, so, yeah. But what is self-efficacy? is a real question because it's like uh, I feel that I have the feeling to engage in preventive behavior that's the definition um, and what determines a person's feeling of being able to determine their future that's apparently income uh, some people feel and further it influences a, a one's decision to share knowledge so if I feel that I can control my own future I'm also more um, induced to make you feel that you can uh, control your own future. Um, and besides self-efficacy, there in literature exists a term called collective efficacy. So some researchers, researchers uh, mean that collective structures also develop this shared belief in ability to attain goals and accomplish a desired task. So we're moving towards the societal compliance now from one's individual feeling of being able to control your own future and being able to um, reduce your impact on incidents in your country to a collective one. Yeah. And yeah, so self-efficacy was kind of easy uh, to sample. We just asked, and we have this data now, so I didn't really need to get that. Um, what about collective efficacy? It's kind of hard to uh, determine or to measure what makes a society go together to fight something like the virus. Um, and basically, Putnam, which is a very big uh, economic researcher, showed that increased ethnic diversity lowers altruism, community cooperation, and number of friendships in America. And this has been replicated in Europe. Um, so I use ethnic diversity as a measure for community cooperation. Yeah. And further, I need to establish that um, we know from research that societal attributes affect your individual characteristics. So um, 
if you live in a very trusting society and you are not a very trusting person, your attribution to trust in society will be lower because you will not be able to um, collectively with your society attribute your feeling of trust. So lower trusting persons in lower trusting societies would mean even lower trust in the whole society as a combination. So I added this interaction between your own feeling um, of trust in the government um, and this ethnic diversity as a measure of collective efficacy. And this is what I find. Yeah, so it's, I know it's kind of messy and it's another, it's actually a three-way interaction, but let's just look at the, the, now the model is split into two waves. So the first wave, that was the first three months of the pandemic. So here we see that higher government trust actually means more compliance. And now compliance is measured as we ask people how much they complied. And this is uh, individually based analysis. Um, and we see further uh, than just trust being a good determinant of compliance, we see that, I don't know if you can read this, but it says low municipal percentage of non-Western foreigners. So the yellow line is um, low ethnic diversity. And we see that people in low ethnic diversity uh, societies who have high trust, they actually um, engage a lot in uh, compliant behavior, but people in high diverse societies, they engage less in compliant behavior. Um, this over here is not significant, so I will actually not comment on that. Further, we see the same result when we put efficacy on the x-axis, so it's measured in a four-point scale. But we basically get the same point. The point here is um, that individuals from more ethnic diverse municipalities feel that they engage less in compliant behavior, and more trusting individuals engage in more compliant behavior, so the same result as from the whole project. And more self-efficacy uh, individuals engage more in compliant behavior. Um, which is kind of a, sh a shocking result, uh, but we'll get to the pol politics later of it, um, because we need to establish one last measure of compliance. Um, and if you remember from before, I defined compliance as the interaction between the um, mobility variables and uh, the stringency levels, so now I'll just make this uh, definition formal. So. And I wanted to see that if these ethnic uh, diversity measures actually could be detected in municipal level compliance as well. So we now have it on an uh, individual level. Can we also see it on a municip mm, uh, or like in the municipalities on a big scale? Uh, so I need like uh, two parameterizations. Uh, I need first civic compliance, and then I need some sort of measure for public mood. So because the hypothesis also stated that uh, more diverse or more um, torn apart societies would be more affected by public mood. So they would, would have a different effect or their compliance would be different um, based on the public mood at a time. So mood would be, will now be measured on Twitter, but that will be how happy are we with the restrictions that's just been, been implemented. Yeah. So first, Definition of civic compliance. Um, yeah, this uh, formula. Uh, so first I standardized uh, trans and mobility change and I time it with the uh, Oxford Restriction Index. So it's basically, this is the interaction between trans and mobility and the Restriction Index. And this is, yeah, so this should say residential uh, mobility change, but that would be the residential compliance. And then I add the two to make one measure of civic compliance. And now it's just the two interactions between the two mobility variables and the restriction index. Yeah. So now the index says that when residential mobility uh, decreases while there's high stringency, the index has a higher value. And when transit mobility decreases while there's high stringency, the index has a higher value. And then these two are added. And that's civic compliance. So how do we measure public mood? Um, and that's, as always, on Twitter, because that's uh, nice to get data from Twitter. It's easy. Um, 
So I wanted to obtain a continuous understanding of how people felt, as I said before. So we scraped all tweets uh, from 1st of March to April 2021. 20, and these were done using 75 search words, COVID, spe COVID uh, specific. And we've basically got like 500,000 COVID, uh, COVID specific tweets. And then we classified them in sentiment. And then I wanted to uh, take into consideration how much the tweet was interacted with. So it got an engagement score, basically how much are the positive uh, tweets retweeted and how much um, are they replied to. But it should say it that here, but it's obviously an error. So how many likes are there? How many retweets are there on the positive and negative uh, retweets? And I just added that as a weight to the proportion of positive and negative tweets. And that's what I call echoing frame of mind. Yeah. So this is the positive score throughout the period, and this is the negative score. And we can just see how it fluctuates. Um, we get a lot of positivity around the first national lockdown. So it seems that the first um, government reaction to the COVID pandemic was very positive in the Danish Twitter landscape. Um, we, have, however, see that when the border of Denmark reopened, there is a surge in negativity. When mink are killed, there is a surge in negativity. When the second national lockdown was uh, announced, uh, like the big one in January, there is actually a positivity spike, which could be inflated because of Christmas here. Um, <laughs> yeah, people are very positive on Twitter because of Christmas and New Year's Eve. I don't know why, <laughs> because it's covert, uh, specific search words. But that's what you always find on Twitter. Um, yeah, and this could, I, then this, uh, the relationship between these two is used as a predictor. So a higher value of F, uh, EFM is basically just more positivity on Twitter. Yeah, then we add this to the model. So election participation times what wave we are in times the mood and this is the societal effect so now we find a counterintuitive um, uh, result because we just saw before that um, the relationship was the other way around so the yellow line was on top before <coughs> meaning that um, lower municipal percent of uh, non-western immigrants actually complied um, more which uh, is kind of weird and we see that these two effects are uh, significant so individuals from more ethnic diverse municipalities feel that they engage less in compliant behavior which we found from the hope survey but municipalities with more ethnic diversity have engaged more in mobility related compliance which we see here and here basically not so significant in the second wave um, so how do we interpret this? Um, so it seems kind of counterintuitive that um, Metaflexin says that there's too much uh, contagion around non-Western immigrants, which is basically the measure that I've used. Um, and we find that they comply more um, in the mobility data. But we also find that people from more diverse societies actually feel uh, that they comply less. So these three things are counterintuitive. Um, unless we think a little about how um, people with more ethnic diversity actually live. So people uh, from more, or municipalities with more ethnic diversity have lower income. Also, they have occupations that cannot work from home. They are more exposed to the virus. They live closer. Um, they don't understand the public rhetoric as much. Um, which in turn means that their mobility reduction in the first wave would look even more significant because when you have a um, work that's uh, far away from your home uh, or like in the field, uh, in the contrary to a job um, at, I don't know, an office or something, it will, your mobility reduction will look much larger because you're used to traveling a lot more and you're used to using public transportation a lot more. So this um, 
result is actually confounded in how we've set up ethnic diverse societies, uh, which makes it even more <laughs> counterintuitive that this is the rhetoric that there can be no doubt uh, about how COVID-19 should be handled. It's people's own responsibility. So this means that this is not people's own responsibility because people do not in one month determine how they live. They cannot actually move during a pandemic. So then the next um, question is, okay, the self-reported compliance, why do people from ethnic diverse societies feel that they comply less? Okay, so we'll try to um, also narrow this down. So this is a day, but I don't know if people know this, but let's say that they have low income. Let's say that they have uh, occupations that cannot work from home, that they have larger population density, um, worse living conditions, um, less self-efficacy, so they don't know how to handle the pandemic as well because they don't understand the government restrictions. Um, this is all attributed to ethnic diversity. This would mean COVID-19 incidents. That's basically all the predictors of higher COVID-19 incidents. And that would mean that people from more ethnic diverse societies would experience that there are more uh, people who have COVID-19 incidents in their municipality because there are because of these demographics, not because people are reckless, or maybe a combination of both, we cannot tell them apart, but that's how we explain the results. And that's how, yeah, uh, Esau ex explained, I guess, with this data. Thank you. So we have like uh, around 15 minutes for our questions. That's a lot of minutes. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't, if anybody has questions, just um, bring them in, or else I can show you something else that's very cool. Um, because what, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, can you show that PowerPoint to my grandparents, maybe? Uh, <laughs> I could, but it would uh, take a long time to explain. <laughs> Did everybody get the interaction parts? I, I know it can be very difficult to see interactions if you... Yeah, if you don't, if you haven't seen it before. Why are you looking over here? So um, because Christian is behind you and he's uh, from the School of Architecture. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm actually curious, can you uh, just summarize like the uh, convoluted aspects of, of what, what's like the contradictions that are happening in these uh, rhetorics that we use? Yeah, so we're talking about the last point I made. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like the last three. So I think what you made in the first part of the study, we actually had tested um, non-Western foreigners against COVID-19 incidents. Uh, and we found that there are more people with COVID in these societies. Um, so we didn't wanna include it in the model because of the rhetoric. Because the rhetoric was, was that people with non-Western backgrounds are getting infected. And it, it sounded like it was their fault, but that was not the point here. The point was that both people in uh, more ethnic diverse societies feel that they comply less because there are more COVID cases in their municipalities. So they feel that COVID is a larger threat to them, but also that because there is bigger mobility reduction in the ethnic diverse societies, we actually know that they have engaged in compliant behavior, but that due to other demogra uh, demographic reasons, they just cannot bring down the incidence level as good, and probably because of some other politics stuff, and just that people are bad at uh, using rhetoric to these places. I don't know, it, it could be multiple reasons. Yeah. So I think that's the counterintuitive part. Yeah, it's and then the way you counted that was including income, for example, as an interaction effect. Yeah, you could. Yeah. yeah, so I just added all predictors. Yeah. Uh, it will be population density, number of people in a community, number of young people, um, I don't know, temperature, COVID cases. Mm -hmm. And then I will see if the effect of um, foreigners is still there. Yeah, because I also read the Putnam study and it, it felt like it wasn't no. 
Yeah, in the sense that, you know, then, oh, I've made this model, I now compute that ethnic diversity is the issue. Yes. And then they don't think, like, what's the next step? Yeah. 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 I, I think Putnam is uh, respectful. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very, very So just uh, to conclude on this little line of reasoning, so this new research insight that you bring forth is kind of moving the responsibility away from these people in ethnic diverse parts of the society, like moving the whole corona responsibility from them and back into the kind of more system-based uh, factors. Mm, like I don't think that that would be uh, an appropriate conclusion, okay. but I think that uh, it gives an interpretation to be society, like people are always, yeah, it's Esau, it's because there are a lot of immigrants, but people don't actually mention why uh, more diverse societies have problems with COVID. Mm -hmm. They just say they live close. Uh, I, I don't know, so what we have established here is that people who live in these societies feel that they engage less in compliant behavior, even though they actually, compared to their own baseline, did engage more in compliant behavior. So people feel differently than they should. Mm -hmm. But because of some demographics uh, surrounding their municipalities, they cannot bring the um, incidence level down. That's my take on it. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, anybody should, like you can't hold uh, Mary Flexen accountable for this uh, because, yeah, but I don't know who should be held accountable. Like it's, uh, I'm not a policy maker. Yeah, but I think it almost sounds like you're moving the focus from the individuals in these municipalities and over towards like poverty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, basically. That would Very be cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you um, say something again about the, the the two variables that you chose, like the 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 location you had, like parks and. Yeah. Presidential areas. So, like, how? Because wh when I saw it, I kind of thought that both residential areas and transit, mm -hmm. like, don't they also explain some of the same? Yeah, I guess variants? they do. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, they could be uh, inflated. So, what yeah. you would. Uh, Theoretically, at that time, so one year ago, we didn't think, but I, I see your point. Um, and what we did to make sure that it's not a problem is just do a variance inflation analysis. So it's when you've done a model, you see basically whether or not there's a problem of multicollinearity in your, yeah. Um, and we didn't find them to be um, good determinants of each other. And you, could, you probably should include that in a paper, which we didn't. And we also got uh, beat up for that exact point. Um, so it's a very good point. Um, but it's, it's impossible. Like, there, are, there are so many yeah. variables. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, because retail and recreation was basically closed. Yeah. Um, workplaces were also like closed. The, uh, the only parks were also closed at some point. They were like, don't go specifically here. They like taped them around. Mm. Uh, grocery and pharmacy stores, they increased. They saw a surge because people were like, okay, we need to yeah. buy things. The only places that were not closed directly, or that, that, or that that's uh, my reasoning now. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I get it if it's skewed, but, and there were residential areas and transit stations. I don't know if it's a good point, but uh, that's what we went with. Yeah, uh, this is there. So you had like these uh, big demographic variables, like levels of, I guess, poverty. Mm -hmm. Did you find other like big demographic variables that kind of had some kind of yeah. discriminatory force? I couldn't actually include it here because it uh, took too long, I thought. But um, part election participation is what I used as the second municipal variable. So this is um, expected to be a determinant of trust how much people um, participate in general e elections. And we see the same, which, um, and I haven't thought about this uh, conclusion yet, 
So that's why I didn't include it, because I ha didn't have an answer for it. Um, but if you just imagine that instead of this saying a uh, percentage of non-Western foreigners, we said that it's election participation in your municipality, we see the same result. Okay. People who trust a lot also, societies who trust a lot has the same effect. What's important here is that mood, uh, so high mood on Twitter, tears these three apart, where, where down here they are not significant, but up here they are significant. And remind me, what's on the x-axis of this? So the x-axis is the mood um, from Twitter. Mm -hmm. So that's used as uh, a determinant for public mood on a given day. Okay. Yes. So when mood is high, when there is a lot of positivity to, towards um, COVID tweets or in COVID tweets, and both, um, or and like your municipal percentage of uh, non-Western foreigners is also high, there is a difference. So it seems that ethnic diverse societies um, are more susceptible to this positivity mm -hmm. that surges, mm -hmm. where other parts, or like you could say the other way around, but I guess um, the hypothesis is that less ethnic diverse societies are not as susceptible to the daily uh, mood because they have more self-efficacy. So they know how to handle this situation better. Yeah. I guess you have kind of the percentage of non for all foreigners, non Western foreigners, something that uh, mm. in a categorical scale right now. But no, it's not have something to do with with places where there's a high percentage of foreigners has uh, maybe a large city like Copenhagen and Aarhus. Yeah. And there's tendencies in those cities that may actually account for the variance that is not necessarily due to the foreigners, but due to the different the traditions and the cultures that are dependent if you're living in a large city or in a smaller city. Yeah. That's exactly um, my thought. Um, from the so this is not categorical, just to be uh, okay. Yeah, but uh, it's because when you make an um, interaction plot, you need to yeah. Yeah, yeah. To but it doesn't really matter. Um, I added number of people um, as a um, control variable, and population density, and number of young people, and just all municipal um, controls that I could find to make sure that this effect did not go away. And it didn't go away. But I, I imagine if you would just add number of people here, you have the same result. Yeah. So we, we wouldn't know if it's say which variable it is that yeah. actually does the But just make sure that when you try to explain your variable, that you include the other one as well. You could in add b both interactions into the model and test that. I don't know if. Sarah? About the whole mood thing, the mood? Like the general mood, yeah, of towards COVID, so not like the restrictions, yeah, specifically, yeah, okay, and that was under the assumption that the mood towards COVID would change how people comply. Yeah, okay. so as we see here, yeah, yeah, okay, I just thought it was towards the restrictions. And um, no, I we didn't. I just took all COVID-related tweets. Yeah, yeah, with the keywords. Yes. But can you not say that on Twitter people are more likely to post at all if they're not satisfied with something? You know what I mean? Yeah. How did you take that into account? Um, so you're saying that if there are more tweets, there are more negativity? No, usually if you're not, if, if everything is fine, then mm -hmm. you don't tweet anything. Yeah. But if there's something that you're like very much against, then you will tweet that you're against it to let people know. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't. Uh, I uh, like kind of took it into account by doing this. So the amount of negative tweets divided by the total amount of tweets, so we have the proportion. And then the EFM, like this is not the predictor. This is just a pretty visual. But these two subtracted is the predictor. Um, so I took the proportion of positive tweets timed by the engagement weight and the proportion of negative tweets timed by the negative engagement weight then I subtracted them, and then I um, smoothed them so that I would be sure. So I made it like a loss smoothing. So you can see 
the tweets doesn't look this pretty. They are like, uh, I wouldn't, they would look like Bitcoin times 10. <laughs> like, uh, but this is a pretty, pretty plot. <laughs> <laughs> it needed to be a pretty plot. <laughs> so I, I don't know, mm, it's, it's impossible. It's a good point. Uh, Alexander. I don't know, there's time, maybe you could uh, um, say what you learned from working with the mobility data, or maybe just like, I don't know, it, to me, it, uh, I didn't know it, it existed, so mm. it sounds like pretty scary. Yeah, uh, it's messy. Okay. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of days without any uh, data, and they basically say don't use it like this, uh, even though every researcher uses it like this. So. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's, what I learned was that it's uh, a nice way to work with uh, social mobility when you only have your computer, like, it's a good proxy, but it, it's never perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to like, uh, mean replace all of the days that there were no uh, data with all of the municipalities that were in the close proximity to be able to make sure that every date had, had a, like, a variable. And then there are some problems with um, bigger cities, as, uh, as Sigurd mentioned, and more Google, Google stations in these cities. So they have more data. Basically, the, the whole thing could be skewed only because of that. Mm. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's the main takeaway. <laughs> uh, yeah? Uh, did you take into account whether the trees like representative? So, isn't it mostly uh, uh, journalists and politicians yeah. on Twitter? <laughs> that's uh, also um, yeah, a good point. Um, and that's what you get all the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I didn't take that into account without just discussing it. So, the discussion or the, the my uh, reasoning is if the top part of the society that will be journalists, um, politicians, sports people, if they are positive, that would ruminate all the way down. And cre and this would be the general discourse at, the give at a given day. So if journalists are positive, they would also write positively in the news, and that would ruminate with society in all municipalities. That's the argument. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right.